Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on anti-poverty initiatives and mental health homelessness interventions hosted by the UC Davis Campus Community Book Project. My name is Megan Macklin, and I serve as Associate Director of Campus Climate and Inclusion Initiatives in the Office of Campus Community Relations, a unit in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at UC Davis. Thank you for joining. To begin, a couple of housekeeping items for our virtual event. Captions can be accessed by clicking the live transcript button in your Zoom window. There you can show or hide subtitles and access the full transcript. Today's event is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the Book Project website. You are invited to ask questions at any point using the Q&A feature. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. While we meet today in a virtual space, we'd like to begin by reading the following statement that acknowledges the land where UC Davis sits. We should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachal Dihi Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, Kletzel Dihi Wintun Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been honored, it has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. The UC Davis Campus Community Book Project promotes dialogue and builds community by encouraging diverse members of the campus and surrounding communities to read the same book and attend related events. The Book Project, a signature initiative out of the Office of Campus Community Relations since 2002, advances the mission to improve both the campus climate and community relations, to foster diversity, and to promote equity and inclusiveness. Currently in our 21st year, the book project in 2022-2023 focuses on the theme of transformative justice and police reform and features Defund Fear, Safety Without Policing, Prisons and Punishment by Zach Norris. Originally titled, We Keep Us Safe, Building Secure, Just and Inclusive Communities, mm -hmm. the book calls upon many systems that play a role in the imperative for community safety, including the criminal legal system, healthcare, education, food and housing access, and support for caregivers. This year's book project theme and selection will be supported by a year-long program of lectures, workshops, book discussions, film screenings, exhibits, performances, and more. Our program culminates when author Zach Norris comes to UC Davis on Thursday, February 16, 2023, to speak at the Mandavi Center for the Performing Arts. For more information about the book project program, visit our website, where you can find up-to-date event information, registration links, and other resources. We also welcome your involvement, students, staff, faculty, and community members, in selecting the book project featured title and in planning our annual program. If you're interested in getting involved with the book project, please send us an email or refer to the book project website for more information. Throughout today's discussion, we will uphold our UC Davis principles of community. We recognize that we may discuss sensitive topics, and we encourage you to practice self-care and seek resources when needed. You can find links to the principles of community and to the book project's mental health resource page on your screen. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Sasha Abramsky teaches in the university writing program at UC Davis. He is the Nation Magazine's West Coast correspondent and is freelanced on social justice themes for dozens of publications in the US, UK, and elsewhere, including The Atlantic, American Prospect, New York Times, Rolling Stone, Salon, Slate, Sacramento Bee, Village Voice, London Guardian, Observer, New Statesman, and many other publications. Sasha is the author of nine books, including The American Way of Poverty, American Furies, The House of 20,000 Books, and most recently, Little Wonder, The Fabulous Story of Lottie Dodd, the world's mm -hmm. first female sports superstar. Thank you so much, Sasha, for joining, and please go ahead and take it away. All right, uh, Megan, thank you so much for the introduction. And I can't see the participants, but I can see how many there are. So I know there are about 30 of you out there. So thank you all for spending a little bit of time this Wednesday afternoon at this event. Um, I should issue a disclaimer, which is that I haven't done Zoom lectures for about a year at this point. And I have to be honest, I was hoping I'd never do Zoom lectures again. Um, I would have dearly loved to have seen you all in person, but I understand the constraints. Um, so. What I've been writing about and thinking about for many, many years are social justice themes and the interconnections between different themes. So the way that criminal justice and poverty interact, let's say, or the way that criminal justice and mental health interact. And I wanted to start today by 
just talking a little bit about the current situation in California vis-a-vis -vis the homeless population, because we're living through this extraordinary moment. We're living through a moment where in many ways, California is the most progressive politically that it has ever been. We've got a raft of very progressive legislatures. We have a governor who self-styles himself as being a progressive. We have a democratic supermajority in the um, state house and, and Senate. We have a voting public that is simpatico with a lot of the more cutting edge social justice themes in the country at the moment, from racial diversity to um, higher living wages and so on and so forth. And yet, at the same time, concomitant with that, we have 160,000 homeless people, and that's probably a conservative estimate. But roughly half of all of the unsheltered homeless population in the country lives in California, which is quite extraordinary if you think about it. There's, there's a big homeless population in New York, but New York has a right to shelter, so they've had to build shelters to accommodate people who can't afford their own houses. But in California, and up and down the West Coast as a whole, has a tremendous problem with unsheltered homeless. And you see it in every city. You see it in Los Angeles. You see it in San Francisco. You see it where I live here in Sacramento. But you also see it in smaller communities. You see it in Davis. You see it in even smaller communities than Davis, where encampments have set up. They've set up under freeway overpasses. They've set up along riverbanks. They've set up just in tent encampments along street sidewalks. Now, this is an issue that is so huge and yet so omnipresent that we sort of take it for granted these days. We walk down the street, we may do a double take occasionally at the encampments, but then we walk on. We don't think how abnormal it is. We don't think how abnormal it's been since the 2008 housing crisis, which really accelerated the homelessness trends in California. I was in Venice Beach last summer. I was doing a story on the encampments that during the pandemic had um, been established alongside the fabled boardwalk of Venice Beach. Now, I imagine that many in the audience are familiar with Venice Beach because it's one of the great tourism sites of Los Angeles and of California as a whole. Millions of people visit it every year because it's a spectacle. But last year, if you were visiting it because it was a spectacle, you would have seen in between the boardwalk and the ribbon of sand, you would have seen a sliver of tents that ran for over a mile. And it turned out that in Venice Beach, both on the boardwalk itself and in the alleyways, um, a little bit off the boardwalk and in the um, streets leading up to the fabled Venice Beach canals, you would have seen several thousand homeless people. Now, the total population of Venice Beach is smaller than Davis. It's 30 or 40,000 people. My memory is, I can't remember the exact percentage, but my memory is somewhere in the region of one in 12 people in Venice last summer were homeless. It was just this absolutely extraordinary failure of social policy. And you saw homeless people with just tremendous struggles with drug addiction and tremendous struggles with mental illness. And you also saw homeless people who've been evicted because affordable housing units, one after another after another, were illegally being converted into Airbnbs for those tourists who came to see the fabled Venice Beach boardwalk. Now, it was creating all kinds of political tensions because the boardwalk was becoming more and more violent. There was an overlap of the violence and the homelessness. It was becoming more and more dysfunctional because there was open drug use. There was all kinds of stuff going on that wasn't sort of necessarily socially good. There were open fires, which had led to a number of quite serious fires going on in the neighborhood. And it was creating a political backlash because residents and business owners wanted something done. And so the council stepped in and they did actually do something. They essentially swept the homeless off the sidewalks and they offered them some kind of accommodation right, but not really. So what you basically had was a, a shuffling process where people were moved from the more visible parts of Venice Beach to the less visible parts as a way of solving a problem without actually solving the fundamentals underlying that problem. Now, for those of you who are familiar with life in California, which is probably all of you because you all live here, you'll know that that's happening in cities up and down the state certainly happening in Sacramento, where I live. Another story that I wrote about last year was the huge, quote unquote, safe spaces that the city had set up for its homeless population under freeways. Now, in one way, this was better than nothing because 
you had this tremendous issue of the unhoused population sort of living anywhere and everywhere in any doorway they could find a space on any riverfront they could find a space and it was dangerous it was dangerous for bystanders and it was dangerous for the residents themselves so the city set up a series of safe spaces but these weren't houses they weren't even tiny houses they were places where you could pitch a tent and they were essentially places under freeways mainly where you could pitch a tent in the noise in the dust in the smoke and you could call it home well again that may or may not have been better than nothing it was probably marginally better than nothing because it was a little bit safer and it did allow social workers to come in and address the issues but these places had no running water they had no electricity they had no sewage systems so the people living in those encampments were essentially living in worse conditions than most refugees live in in refugee camps around the world literally scavenging for water and literally having to find a tree to go to the bathroom under and this is in the the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country in the world um so what's going on here well partly in california it's a grievous reflection of decades long failures of housing policies there's an inability and a lack of political will to build affordable housing in an over-regulated housing market that vastly jacks up the cost of constructing new homes. It costs more to build houses in California than in any other state. So people don't build low-end, low affordable houses. Disproportionately, construction workers want, uh, construction companies want to come in and build high-end, expensive houses that have more bang for the buck, which is all well and good for a middle or upper class resident, but it doesn't address the fundamental problem that hundreds of thousands of Californians are struggling with the basic issue of how to put a roof over their head. Now, as a progressive, I always like to blame the right wing for what's going on, but it's not always true. And one area it's certainly not true on is CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is a wonderful act. And it was set up to provide an array of environmental protections when developments were being proposed. It's a wonderful act, but it's been hijacked essentially by the NIMBYist movement. So anybody who doesn't want a shelter or an affordable housing unit or a high density family housing unit in their neighborhood, they raise a CEQA objection and that development gets postponed and delayed by years and years of litigation. And we see this all over the state. We saw it most high profilely last year in Berkeley when a CEQA lawsuit temporarily put a hold on the building of more student dorms. And until the legislature stepped in to intervene, it looked like Berkeley would have to revoke the offers that they had made to thousands of incoming students because of this NIMBYist lawsuit. So one of the issues in California is simply an issue of housing. There isn't enough housing being built and there isn't enough affordable, low cost housing being built within that housing pool. And so we have this growing number of people who struggle to find and maintain housing stability. But the thing is, it's not all about housing. It's partly about housing. But there are other issues also in play, too. And the most obvious one of these is the abysmal failure of the mental health system over the last 50 or 60 years to create an infrastructure to allow meaningful care in the community. So this is a history that's probably well known, but let me reiterate it. In the 1960s and 70s, there was a massive movement, not just in California, but nationwide against institutionalization of the mentally ill. And it started actually in California under Governor Ronald Reagan. And the idea was that the hospitals that were providing homes and supposedly treatment for seriously mentally ill people were deeply inhumane, that they were all of the one flew over the cuckoo's nest mold, and that we had an obligation to do better. And so one state after another began shuttering most of its mental health facilities. And the promise was, that that care would be picked up by care in the community infrastructure. So the people who needed treatment would receive it and they would receive it in a more humane way that would better society. Well, that didn't happen. What did happen was the shuttering of mental health institutions. What did happen was wholesale deinstitutionalization. What followed was a double crisis, massive homelessness among the seriously mentally ill and massive incarceration of the seriously mentally ill because the prisons and jails of this country became de facto first responders for a mental health crisis that state mental health and public health systems were no longer dealing with. So if you look 60 years on from deinstitutionalization, one of the consequences at the back end of that process has been the massive 
wholesale homelessness of people with serious mental illnesses. So in other words, the, the kind of homelessness has changed. It's not just people who are struggling to find housing because of the cost of housing. It's also increasingly people who are struggling to find housing because of very, very serious health issues that they're facing that should be dealt with by the mental health infrastructure. And there are various reasons it's not. Part of it is just cost. It costs an awful lot of money to create community mental health infrastructure. Part of it is legally, it's harder and harder to mandate that seriously mentally ill people get treatment. And that may be changing. Um, Governor Newsom's community care courts, the, these mental health courts, have a degree of uh, obligation attached to them. There's an ability to mandate people into treatment. That's controversial. And there's no agreement on it as to whether it's a good or bad thing. The ACLU says it's a very bad thing. National Alliance for the Mentally Ill says it's a very good thing. I personally think it's needed. Um, I know other people who've studied the issue who don't think it's needed. It's a controversial issue. But certainly over the coming years, as publics get more and more frustrated by the durability of the homelessness crisis, certainly there's going to be more pressure on legislators and governors to find ways to address the mental illness crisis, which is a core part of the homelessness issue. Now, another one which is sort of tied in with that, but a little bit separate, is escalating drug addiction. And we saw epidemics in the 80s and 90s of crack and heroin, and we're seeing epidemics today of methamphetamine and of opioids, especially around fentanyl. And the destruction that fentanyl in particular is rorting on society it's obvious for everyone to see. There are now 100,000 overdose deaths a year in America. And they have been since 2020 when the pandemic hit. And the pandemic obviously accelerated that. It created all kinds of societal dislocation, all kinds of tensions. It undermined existing care structures. It pushed people who were needed treatment out away from treatment because a lot of facilities shut down. And so it escalated and accelerated an already developing crisis. But if you look at that crisis, the drug addiction crisis and the quality of that drug addiction crisis today, the mental illness crisis, and you then add in a third one, which is de-incarceration of prisoners, which again is partly tied in with mental illness since so many mentally ill end up in prison and partly tied in with drug addiction since so many people with addiction issues also end up in jail and prison. But this is another issue that plays into homelessness, that for 20 or 30 years, we... California and most states in the country stampeded towards a mass incarceration model. We had a tough and crime model. We had laws like three strikes and you're out. We had this lock them up mentality. And so we tried to deal with really, really complex social problems by throwing billions and then tens of billions of dollars into expanding our prison systems. And by the end of that process, California had nearly three dozen prisons and it had upwards of about 150,000 prisoners, I believe, at its peak. Or I may be slightly off of the numbers, but somewhere in that range. And over the last 10 years, for a variety of reasons, partly court rulings that said that prisons were so overcrowded that they were unsafe and constituted cruel and unusual violations, cruel and unusual punishments. So partly for those court reasons and partly also there was a societal shift and there was a realization that mass incarceration didn't work. It didn't work morally. It didn't work in terms of reducing recidivism and it didn't work financially because it costs about $100,000 a person to incarcerate people in California. It's very, very expensive. So from Governor Jerry Brown's tenure onwards, there's been this move in California to roll back mass incarceration. Now, it took three decades to build the system. It's going to take decades to reduce the system again. But it has been significantly reduced. We now have under 100,000 prisoners, which is good. The downside of that is we also have a tremendous problem where people cycle out of prison. They can't get jobs. They don't have money and they can't get housing. And housing is a particular problem, because if you go to prison, you come out and the landlord does a criminal justice background check. They see that you have a record and they don't want to rent to you. Or even if they do want to rent to you, you don't have the money to pay for a month's security deposit and then the first month's rent because you've just come out of prison. So a disproportionate number of California's homeless population are people who've cycled in and out of jail and prison. And they can't work and they're increasingly marginalized from the broader society by the stigma of incarceration, even though California has something called ban the box, where in theory, employers can't ask about the jobs, the criminal justice status of a job applicant. In practice, once they get to the interview stage, 
if a company does a background check, they can find out you have a criminal justice record and they can find a reason to not give you that job. So ex-prisoners find it very hard to get stable employment. If they do get employment, it's usually low end casual labor and very low wage and they struggle to get housing. So you have this sort of trifecta of problems. You have mental illness, you have drug addiction, and you have the after effects of mass incarceration. And all of that creates an overemphasis on homelessness. It creates mean, means people are more likely to end up homeless. So what can be done about this? Now, this talk is in tandem with the broader book project about defunding fear about how to get to a point in time where we're not reliant on law enforcement to deal with our major societal crises. And it seems to me there are many things that we can do around homelessness and mental illness that don't rely on law enforcement or on police as first responders all the time. So for, for example, in Eugene, Oregon, if you call into 911, you say, all right, there's someone on the street having a crisis. Maybe they're sort of hitting things and they seem to be mentally ill. The 911 system will not send out law enforcement responders. It will send out specialized groups, specialized teams who've been trained in mental health responses. And the idea behind that is you can de-escalate, that you can treat the problem. You can get the person who's having an episode on the street whatever help they need. And if they're dangerous, you can move them into a place where they're not going to be dangerous, but you don't necessarily want to channel that person into the court system where they're then going to end up in jail or prison. It's a way of de-escalating a potentially confrontational situation. Um, another example is trauma recovery centers. Now this is something that has taken off because groups like the Alliance for Safety and Justice in recent years have done a lot of study of what happens when both victims of crime, but also perpetrators of crime who themselves are often victims from the past. What happens when you open up trauma recovery centers and specialists can get involved to talk people through their traumas and to help them get beyond the effects of those traumas? Well, measurably, you see that what happens is a reduction in crime, a reduction in violence. So you're not using law enforcement. You're using psychological interventions. You're using social service techniques. But one of the consequences is you impact our levels of crime. One of the other consequences is you make it more likely that people become functional enough to hold down jobs and hold down housing. So you impact the condition of homelessness. Um, another example would be the youth intervention programs in places like Newark, New Jersey, which have been pioneered in recent years to very, very carefully identify at risk youth, youth who are not just at risk of becoming victims of crime, but at risk because of various societal factors of committing crimes and thus getting involved in the criminal justice system and in the long run spiraling into a situation where they're more likely to end up homeless, less likely to be employed and so on. Now, again, there's a track record there those interventions work. There's data backing it up that shows that they will work, but yet they haven't been brought to scale at a national level. So all of these things could be done. They could be done in California, certainly, where we have a nearly $300 billion budget and where we have a progressive legislator and a progressive governor who are looking to find ways to address crises within the criminal justice system, crisis of poverty within the community, and most particularly, the escalating crisis of homelessness, of the unhoused population in California. And it could be done nationally as well. And actually, one of the very few issues in our polarized political environment where there's something of a political consensus that's emerged in the last decade is in the arena of criminal justice reform, where you find that a tremendous number of Republicans, as well as Democrats, are now in favor of looking for alternatives to just the lock them up approach. Now, that got a bit complicated in this last election cycle because the Republicans realized that playing the tough on crime card in an era in which crime was spiking again would play well with a sliver of voters. And so the Republicans began sort of doing the Willie Horton thing again. They began demagoguing on crime. But I'm hoping that's just a sort of election era glitch, because, as I said, for about 10 years now, a lot of Republicans have joined with Democrats in saying that we need this new approach that de-emphasizes law enforcement and re-emphasizes community engagement and community involvement. So I think what I want to say here before I wrap up, and I will in about five, 10 minutes, throw it open to you guys for questions, but I want you to think about the extent of the overlap 
between conditions of poverty in the United States and criminal justice involvement in the United States. Because we, it's so commonplace now, we take it for granted. We think of crime, we think of poor people. We think of law enforcement, disproportionately we think of poor people. Obviously we think of homelessness, disproportionately we think of poor people. But one of the consequences of not thinking outside the box on this is we rely too much on law enforcement to solve our complex societal problems. And as a result, we dramatically underinvest in non-punitive anti-poverty strategies. And we dramatically overinvest in punitive punish-based systems. Now, over the decades, I've done a lot of work on this. I've done a lot of work following people in, inside prisons. I've done a lot of work on poverty and inequality. Um, and the more work I've done on both of them, the more it strikes me that in America, they are very much two sides of the same coin. Um, we have in this country about 15% of our country who lives below the poverty line. It goes up and it goes down. And actually during the pandemic, it went down tremendously because there was so much government intervention. But that was temporary intervention. During the pandemic, we actually massively reduced trial poverty numbers. But again, a lot of the financial interventions that made that reduction possible have now ended. A lot of the tax credits have ended. A lot of the um, financial monthly packages have ended. A lot of the extra unemployment benefits have ended. And so we're now seeing a bounce back of poverty measures. And that's a very, very bad thing, because if we allow poverty to bounce back up again, we're creating all of those conditions that a, make it more likely that law enforcement plays a front center stage role in our society's social policy, and B, makes it more likely that we fail to get a handle on the homelessness crisis and the homelessness epidemic. Now, because so many people live in poverty and because we have such a culture of violence and fear in this country, the levels of inequality here create conditions for the police and by extension, the broader public to view, quote, the poor as by default something akin to the enemy. And in such a system, policing becomes less about an enforcement fairly and squarely of the rules governing society and more of a matter of social control. Of, of a selective patrolling, not of everybody, but of some people. Now, again, there are ways to limit this. For example, we can pass laws saying that once people are arrested and once they are sentenced, we'll only do the minimum necessary of monitoring at the back end. That doesn't mean we'll eliminate probation, doesn't mean we'll eliminate parole, but we'll use it selectively. We'll use it sparingly. We'll use it when courts genuinely deem that the person impacted is a threat to society, but we won't use it as a default. Because if we use it as a default, there's a paradox. We think we're making people safer by monitoring ex-prisoners in a very rigid way, but maybe we over-monitor them to the point that they can't get a job because they have so many appointments with parole and probation. Well, if they can't get a job, then they can't get housing. If they can't get housing, then they end up on the streets. So we've created a dysfunctional, unvirtuous circle. So one thing we could do is strip back somewhat the over-monitoring of our parole and probation population. Another thing we could do is counter racially discriminatory policing, which has obviously received a lot of attention in the last few years, but it's still an ongoing problem. If you're black, if you're brown, if you're poor, you are more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system than if you are not black, not brown, and not poor. And that's neither fair nor functional. It's morally unfair and it's societally dysfunctional because it creates pools of people who are disproportionately at risk of so much law enforcement involvement that it impacts them profoundly economically. We can invest more funds into job training. We can certainly invest more funds into community mental health and drug treatment. We can regulate slum housing better. We can expand our pool of affordable housing and more particularly, we can jumpstart our public housing project because for decades now, we've built almost no new public housing. Now, none of this implies that we're going to completely dismantle the police force or completely dismantle the prison system. I don't personally like the rhetoric of defund. I don't think it's particularly helpful. I do think we need to reduce the amount of money that we use for these systems. But I think at the end of the day, Personally, I think we need some policing and personally, I think we need some prison system, but we need to use it as a last resort, not a first resort. 
And we need to use those tens of billions of dollars that we would not be spending if we had a smaller prison system or a less militarized police system. We need to be using that money to invest in non-carceral, non-punitive, non-law enforcement strategies to complex societal problems. So the way I'm gonna end this, I said I'd speak for about half an hour. I do wanna open it up for questions. My profound hope is that over the coming years in a state like California in particular, where we have the language of progressive politics, and in some cases we have the commitment for progressive politics. My hope is that in the next few years, our non-law enforcement responses to poverty will continue to grow, and that our law enforcement responses will be limited, strictly limited to situations where there is a genuine risk to the public, rather than simply being used as catch-alls to deal with drug epidemics, homelessness epidemics, and mental health crises because we're never going to out arrest our way out of those problems. It's a whack-a-mole strategy that can never and will never work. And we've got to move on from it. We've got to move on to a situation that treats the mentally ill, treats the drug addicted, treats the homeless with respect and with dignity, and that offers them meaningful ways to get out of the crises and the problems that they're currently facing. So I, on that note, I want to thank you very much. I wish dearly I could see all your faces, but I'm imagining that you're all sitting out there desperately waiting to ask questions. So on that note, I'm going to stop. Please take it away. Thanks so much, Sasha. So to our audience, please feel free to use the Q&A function to um, pose your question. We have some questions coming in already. What I'll do is I will um, copy paste them into the chat so folks can see while I read along. So here's our first question. Larger corporations during 2008 were able to buy up housing that homeowners were unable to pay mortgages on. What part does the lack of regulation play in the lack of affordable housing? That's a good question. And the answer is a huge part that if you and the, the housing crisis in 2008 created a sort of rupture when millions and millions of homeowners lost their homes, basically, people couldn't afford their mortgages, they went under the water on their mortgages, they lost their jobs, they were selling, I saw people I was doing stories on it at the time, there were people who were having bake sales and, you know, Friday afternoon garden sales, not to raise money for their kids to go on a school holiday, but to raise money to pay their mortgage or rent, it was extraordinary. And you saw millions of people as a result moving out of houses that they thought they had owned and was secure in. And you saw a reversion in many places to rentals. And one of the consequences was homes were bought on the cheap by corporations. And those corporations then turned around and they had a huge rental stock and they rented at inflated prices to people who'd newly been disempowered because they'd lost their homes. So that was the twin crisis. You had a collapse in the value of a lot of people's houses combined with the fact that you had a rise in rental prices and that rise in rental prices is still going on. Um, so the regulatory systems are profound there because you know, so states and the federal government can choose how or how not to regulate the housing market. They can choose how or how not to provide protections for people at risk of going into default on their mortgages. They can provide um, re regulations onto how or how not to regulate the rental markets. And that's been a huge issue in California because historically, unlike New York, which does have some rent stabilization and rent control measures, historically, California cities have been very, very restrictive in what they can do around rent control and 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 other rent restrictions. And so that's been changing over the last 10 years. You've had a lot of local efforts in California to regulate the rental markets in particular, and that's important and it's necessary. Um, but the other thing that has to go on in California is regulations around affordable housing. So if you're gonna build a new development, you should have an obligation to have a percentage of that development put aside for low-income residents. Um, you should have a percentage put aside for high density housing. Um, it, you know, it, it, you're not going to get you're not going to solve California's housing problem if you say that every single house in the neighborhood has to be low density ranch housing. You're not going to build enough houses. But if you can build apartment buildings and rent out two and three bedroom apartments, then you can get a handle on it. But again, that comes back to what I was saying earlier about neighborhood resistance, that you run into this barrage of neighborhood resistance, which is you know, really hypocritical. You have people who say, I'm a progressive. I want these good laws. I just don't want a high density building in my neighborhood because I like the two bedroom homes in my neighborhood. Well, if everybody says that, then you get no high density building developments and you have a housing crisis that escalates instead of gets better. 
And so, you know, a lot of it is to do with regulation. We set the tone as a society. We set the tone as to what kind of housing we want and what kind of housing we don't want. And our politicians set a tone by, you know, what regulations they pass. And if we don't pass regulations that expand the housing pool, then we have a housing crisis. Thank you. So we have a question kind of related to this topic. Um, our participant wrote, living in Berkeley, it seems to me the problem isn't so much a lack of interest in building housing, affordable or otherwise, as the nimbyism that prevents those projects from moving forward. What can we do to combat that attitude? I, well, I agree with the speaker, and that's sort of what I was saying, that you know, nimbyism is quite an unhealthy phenomenon because it basically allows you to say, yes, we, I want this in theory. I just want it somewhere else. Um, what can we do to combat it? You know, again, this this is probably an unpopular position among progressives, but I would say we urgently need to re-examine CEQA because CEQA is misused and it's misused and it's become a sort of nimbious charter at this point. So if I were trying to do this, I would certainly keep CEQA for its genuine environmental impact, but I would limit the way, for example, I mean, that 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 example that got so much attention and controversy in Berkeley, where the speaker's from, where the questioner is from, you know, that that nimbious lawsuit to stop Berkeley building more student housing. I mean, that was an absolute absurdity. You know, the idea that you could sort of stand in the way of thousands of people getting an access to higher education because you don't want a high rise building in your neighborhood. That makes no sense. So I, I do think that you know, we have to have an honest conversation about the kinds of regulations that Nimbius take advantage of. We have to work out a way to get better regulations that don't gut, you know, everybody wants environmental protections, everybody wants um, regulations to keep the quality of life and the, the standard of living up. But at the same time, you have to have an ability to build housing. And we just don't in California at the moment. Here's another question from our audience. Um, I see a trend locally to pass legislation to move homeless folks around. Um, for example, they can't be near schools, et cetera. What do you think of this trend? And do you think that these ordinances can be found to be legally sound? Do you think Martin v. Boise will render them ineffective? Um, the, the Boise ruling is, the Boise ruling which came out of Idaho, I think five years, four or five years ago, makes it very difficult for municipalities and counties to move people off of public sidewalks if they're camping in public areas unless there's housing that they can be offered and so because cities up and down the west coast just haven't built enough shelters or enough affordable housing and therefore they can't offer the housing these huge encampments have grown and the courts have basically made it quite difficult to step in this year the public's getting really fed up and so you see a, a raft of um, initiatives passing measure o in Calo in sacramento for example which make it easier for law enforcement to remove the homeless off of sidewalks. Now, will it stand up to Boise? It will if at the same time the cities and counties start building affordable housing and building shelters. So this was the promise of Measure O, and this is why Daryl Steinberg, the mayor of Sacramento, who you know is an advocate for the mental health issues, he has been his whole career. Um, but one, you know, one thing that Daryl Steinberg pushed was a measure that would allow the police to remove people from public areas and the sidewalks, but that would offer some forms of alternative housing. And that has to be the case, whether it's tiny houses built by the city in, in encampment areas or whether it's shelters or affordable housing units. You have to have the willingness to invest money. And, it, you know, it's not cheap. You can't do this thing sort of with no funds. But we've invested, you know, to, to put it in perspective, we spend about 10 to 12 billion dollars every year on maintaining the California prison system. We have done for two or three decades at this point. So that's hundreds of billions of dollars over that 20, 30 year period. Well, the prisons are partly about keeping serious offenders behind bars. But increasingly, as I was talking about earlier, they were just a way of providing a very, very expensive mental health and housing intervention to people at the bottom of the society economically or people at the bottom of the society with health and mental health issues. So if we can invest that much money on housing in a carceral setting, surely we have the resources to invest money in a non-carceral setting to achieve a similar outcome. And so I do believe that these laws are going to be constitutional and the courts will uphold them if the cities and counties come up with alternative housing at the same time. Thank you. So I'm um, shifting towards a couple of questions we received about the prison system. 
California has many prisons and so many people make a living off of or profit from the prison industrial complex. How do we shift our economy away from that? Well, I think we've already begun shifting our economy away from it. There was there was this moment a generation ago where small towns all over the country, like Florence, Arizona, or some of the small towns in West Texas, were sort of begging, literally sort of begging corporations to come in and build private prisons. And that movement kind of ebbed. And even the state prisons, where the profit motive isn't quite so extreme, that movement to build prisons to provide jobs <coughs> isn't there anymore. Um, you know, in California, 10, 15 years ago, one of the most powerful unions in California was the Correctional California Correctional Police, Peace Officers Union, which was the Prison Guards Union. And they would lobby in Sacramento for legislation. And it was a political third rail to cross them. You just wouldn't propose legislation that the Peace Officers Association wasn't simpatico with. And now that doesn't hold anymore. Politicians now routinely propose and pass legislation rolling back the size of the prisoner population. Now, what they haven't done yet, and which you know probably sort of speaks to the lingering legacy of the criminal justice lobby, what they haven't done yet is close prisons. But I think that's just a matter of time. Um, you have seen closing of juvenile facilities, and I think it's a matter of time before you start seeing some of these nearly three dozen adult prisons also start to shutter. Now, in terms of what you do for jobs, you know, obviously, I mean, the way to think of this is somewhat similar to what happens to coal communities when we move to clean energy. Well, if you're going to do this well, and if you're going to do it in a way that doesn't prove politically poisonous, you have to provide new jobs. So, you know, Green New Deal advocates talk about retraining people into clean energy fields, retraining people into, you know, whether it's solar power or, um, or you know, producing electric vehicles. There are a whole bunch of things that can be done to reintegrate people who did work in dirty, dirty fuel industries into cleaner industries. Same thing with criminal justice. The prison guards maybe aren't going to be prison guards forever and ever, but they certainly could be retrained as social workers or as drug crisis intervention workers or as homeless advocates. There, there are a whole bunch of things they actually have a lot of skills for. You know, a, a prison guard has dealt with really often very dysfunctional situations and individuals. And it's easy to demonize and say, all oh, prison guards are brutal, blah, blah, blah. Some are, some aren't, but many are very conscientious. And those prison guards, if they're going to be out of work because our social priorities change, we've got to find a way to reintegrate them into the economy. And there are ways to do that. And certainly, you know, there's no shortage of need for drug treatment facilities. There's no shortage of need for homeless facilities. I think we could, you know, if the will was there, we shouldn't have a problem reintegrating these individuals into other jobs. But, you know, the idea that there's somehow a God given right for tens of thousands of people in a state to be prison guards or other prison workers every year, that doesn't you know, exist. There is no God given right to that. And if those if those jobs dry up, we're going to have to find other jobs to put people into. Our next question um asks for more examples, should you have any, Sasha, along um, this theme. Are there examples where funding for incarceration has been repurposed to create transitional housing, employment, and health care where recidivism data has been improved? It's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I suspect there probably are, just because so many states are rolling back mass incarceration policies at the moment. Um, but actually, I, you know, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of bluster my way through that question. All right, um, let's move on to, we had a, here we go, a specific question about legislation. Could California implement a right to shelter like New York has? Why are we not, would that be successful or unsuccessful in California? Well, the answer is we absolutely could. There's nothing in our state laws or constitution preventing us doing that. It takes a tremendous amount of political will. Um, you know, one of the, <laughs> One of the unfortunate political realities of our moment is even though California is a very progressive state, the real estate lobbies are very powerful in Sacramento and also very powerful at the city level. Developers, uh, you know, developers have a lot of political clout and developers hate the idea of affordable housing because that's not where the money is. And so, yes, we could and we should have a right to shelter. But there's a lot of momentum against that. Um, and it's not just developers. You've also got, you know, as I said, all, all these nimbus currents within society especially middle class communities that want to preserve the texture and fabric of their neighborhood which is great but it does limit the amount of affordable housing we can build um 
cities are talking about it. Sacramento has been talking about a right to shelter. That's been quite high up Mayor Steinberg's um, priority list, but we haven't got there yet. Um, and, and, you know, it's a very complicated issue. You can you can pass a law saying, all right, everybody in California has a right to shelter, but you have 160,000 conservative estimate, 160,000 homeless, and about 70% 70, 70 of our homeless are unsheltered. So how do you get to that right to shelter? Well, you could do things like build affordable tiny homes, the tiny homes movement, you know, basically these small module homes, and you can build them for ten to $20,000 a pop. So you could do that for a few billion dollars, which in California's budget is affordable and doable. But then where do you put those tiny homes? Well, you, you know, you're talking about a lot of homes that have to go somewhere and you could put them on public land, but then you're going to have lawsuits about the use of public land. You could try and put them on private land, but a lot of private landowners don't want that. You could buy space. I guess you could use eminent domain, but then you're going to again come into a whole bunch of lawsuits. So in theory, we could do it. And in practice, it's going to be very hard to implement. Um, on the other hand, New York did do it, and they they have a homeless crisis still. I mean, if you're walking around Manhattan these days, you see a lot of people on the streets, but you don't see vast encampments in the way that California, Oregon, and Washington have vast encampments. And at least in part, that's because of the right to shelter law and the fact they've had to, over 10 or 20 years, build more shelters. Continuing on the topic of affordable housing, how can the cost of affordable housing be reduced um, sufficiently in order to get it built? And I guess a corollary to that would be, is cost the issue that should be focused on primarily? So number one, cost is the issue. Number two, any affordable housing has to be subsidized, especially in California, because our regulations make it so expensive to build housing. So if you do it at a market level, you basically price a lot of people out. So what we should say is it's a societal good. We need people to be housed. Um, it saves us a ton of money in law enforcement. It saves, it saves us a ton of money in other areas if we can get people housed. So maybe we have to work out a situation where we subsidize each individual affordable housing unit by a given number of thousands of dollars. Well, again, that's expensive, but it's less expensive than some of the alternatives. So, you know, if you, if you think a measurable percentage of people who are homeless end up in jail and prison, once they're in jail and prison, we spend $100,000 a year on them. So if they're in jail or prison for 10 or 15 years of their adult life, that's a million dollars we're spending as a society on keeping that person locked up. But maybe for $100,000, we could subsidize a home that makes it far less likely that they're going to involve in the criminal justice system. Well, how do you sell that? Because people are sort of inherently suspicious of the idea my tax dollars going to somebody who's undeserving, blah, blah, blah. Well, you have to sell it, at least in part, as a matter of self-interest, that all of us as taxpayers benefit if we reduce the amount of money we're spending on law enforcement, or if we reduce the cost of crime, or if we reduce the cost of um, drug overdoses, that there are these things that have measurable financial impacts that are being made worse because of our dysfunctional housing situation. So I think, you know, partly you have to appeal to self-interest. Also, partly you have to appeal to altruism and to moral generosity. The fact that there are a goodly number of people in California who are deeply morally uncomfortable with the fact that we tolerate 100 plus thousand people living on our streets every night. And I think that's a crucial part of this conversation. Empathy, moral empathy. Um, and I think we can go not all the way with that, but we can go a good part of the way with that. Thank you. So picking up on this thread around um, moral empathy, there seems to be a lack, a profound lack of mercy for homeless individuals entangled in the criminal legal system. Why do you think that is? And how do we advocate for more mercy? Yeah, I think it's a good point. I, because it's frustrating, because we see people who are homeless. And, you know, I'm not excluding myself from this. You know, I see people who are homeless in my neighborhood and I get frustrated. Because, you know, it's an eyesore. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of things that make us look at this population and think, don't like it. It's an eyesore. It's dangerous. It's criminal, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, again, there's always an element of truth to that. And then it gets exaggerated out of perspective. So I think, you know, one of the reasons we tolerate so much law enforcement involvement against the homeless population is we assume it's monolithic. We assume everybody homeless is addicted. We assume everybody homeless is criminal. We assume everybody homeless is up to no good, and that's why they're homeless. Well, it's not the case. It just it, it just isn't. There's a lot of people who are homeless because they can't afford the next month's rent. 
There's a lot of people who are homeless because they were victims of domestic violence. There are a lot of people who are homeless because they are addicted and they've been trying to get off their, their substance abuse and they can't find treatment that works. Um, there are a lot of people who are homeless because they have a mental illness and they're difficult to be around because, you know, they scare people or they are just difficult to manage and they lose their family connections. They burn too many bridges and they're homeless. Well, yes, they're difficult to be around, but they're still human beings who need treatment. So surely a better solution would be get them off the streets, get them out of those tents, get them out of the encampments and have supportive housing available that makes it easier to link them up with treatment that's actually going to change their lives for the better. And so, you know, I, I think part of our challenge in discussing this is how do we create a language that brings people into the conversation? We want people to be coming into this conversation Again, transcending politics, doesn't matter if they're left wing, right wing, conservative, liberal. We want people in a conversation here saying, all right, this is a societal problem. Nobody benefits when we have hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Nobody benefits when, you know, our default response to drug addiction and to mental illness is prison. It just doesn't work. So what do we do to make things better? And I think if you can sort of take the ideology out of it, you can bring more people into that conversation. Our next question reads, do you think if we were able to fully address the roots of mental health issues and the factors that lead to more violent forms of crime, that we would be able to move past the need for policing? Is it a last resort level of policing necessary? I don't think we'll ever be able to move entirely past policing. And, you know, this is this this comes back to what I was saying about me being somewhat suspicious of the concept of defunding the police. Um, I do think we can get to a level where crime is far less prevalent, where violence is certainly far less prevalent. And this is something I haven't talked about today, but should. You know, if we're going to really be serious about violence, we can whack a mole as much as we like, but we're going to have far more success with meaningful gun control policy, which is, is a sort of no brainer. You know, if you take away the ability to go on a mass shooting spree, then you're not going to have mass shooting sprees. If you make it easier to go on a mass shooting spree, then you're going to have mass shooting sprees. So I, I think these, you know, th there are a lot of moving parts here. We can certainly reduce our emphasis on law enforcement. We can certainly reduce the amount of money we spend on the police and on the criminal justice system more generally. But do I think we're ever going to get to a point where we don't need any police officers or don't need any incarceration structures? Personally, no. And I, you know, I get into arguments. I have friends who think, you know, that I'm a hopeless reformist liberal and that, you know, true radicals would always say abolish the police. Um, I don't see how we get there. And I also, you know, pragmatically, I don't see how that argument sells politically. And I think, you know, whenever you're having a political conversation, you've got to be in the land of realism. And if you start talking about defund the police, you're providing a tremendous gift to very, very conservative authoritarian forces who would like nothing better than to expand the police. And you're giving them a golden opportunity because you're making it a sort of either or issue. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. So here's our second to last question. Is there a way to tie development profit to address the societal costs for unsheltered populations? Real estate profits continue to escalate as local governments drain their funds to improve public safety and the safety of the unhoused. If there is no financial penalty for real estate business incentives that increase homelessness, how will it ever change? You know, that's a great question. I, I don't know the ins and outs of real estate tax law, um, but I assume there is in the same way as we talk about um, profit surcharges on um, oil companies at the moment. That's an ongoing conversation. Uh, Governor Newsom's been talking very much about increasing the tax burden on energy companies that are exploiting the moment to make super profits. So if you can have that conversation about the oil industry, I assume you can have that conversation about real estate. Um, the exact mechanics, I don't know how you do it, but I don't think there's any sort of abstract reason why you shouldn't be able to increase taxes on on corporations who are making real estate profits. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a tax law specialist, so I'm just guessing on that one. So for our final question, I, I hope this will um, lead us towards thinking about what we all can do, um, given all the insights and expertise that you've shared today, Sasha. Our um, person who wrote the question um, wrote, I think the scope of this problem can be overwhelming and lead to the inclination to throw up one's hands. If we could get those of us here today to work on a single issue, where would you recommend we start? That, that's a great question. Um, I, personally, I, I would start on the right to shelter. 
Uh, I think if you can convince localities to pass right to shelter legislation, then you change the dynamics because you channel money into building affordable housing, you channel money into building supportive housing, you channel money into building shelters, and then you can have meaningful talk conversation about you know, whether or not it makes sense to end homeless encampments. At the moment, we're just shuffling people from place to place. We take them you know, from one freeway overpass and then they show up a day later, two blocks north. Um, the far more important question is a systemic question. How do we reduce the total number of people who are homeless well, the most obvious way is you provide a legal right to shelter, and then you see what cities and counties do in response to that. Um, so that, that's where I would get started. Um, I think the other one is, again, I don't know your specialties, but let's say you happen to have a degree in social work or mental health services. You know, there's so much need for on the street mental health services, on the street substance abuse services, non-punitive, non-incarcerative, but meaningful intervention. So I, I think, you know, depending on area of expertise, those are other areas that I, I would think we need much more attention paid to. Thanks so much. Um, thank you, Sasha, for this brilliant talk and for engaging in this question and answer. Um, we had a lot of questions and really um, appreciate you taking the time to address some of those questions that our audience had. Um, I want to remind folks that um, this event was recorded and a recording is going to be made available on the Book Project website. I also um, want to invite um, our audience on the behalf of the Campus Community Book Project. Um, we hope that you will join us for our next program on Friday, December 2nd at noon, the UC Davis Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing Interprofessional Book Club will host the first of three book discussions on this year's book project selection defund fear. And those discussions will be facilitated by Jan Marie Garcia. All are welcome at this free event. And finally, we welcome your feedback on today's event and invite you to complete a brief survey, which you can access via the QR code or web address listed on the screen as an incentive and thank you for your participation in the survey. At the end, you will have the opportunity to enter into a prize drawing to potentially win a copy of this year's book project selection. Again, thank you, Sasha. Thank you to all our attendees, and we hope to see you at a future book project program. Take care.